At a heathen funeral, ashes are rubbed on faces to express the hopelessness in their hearts. We felt sometimes the very darkness of Satan in those lands, in the Congo. And we know what it is to be up against the forces of evil. And when I opened my mouth to speak in the gospel and spoke of the Lord Jesus, this woman snarled blasphemies and obscenities. And uh, whether I should call her demon-possessed or not, I don't know. But she had all the evidences of being demon-possessed and cursed the name of the Lord Jesus and spat on the ground when she heard his name and went off screaming into the forest. Violence and chaos in the Congo. Barely 11 days after official independence from Belgium, Congolese troops mutiny and begin a wave of attacks and looting throughout the far-flung sectors of the former colony. My, uh, yes, I can say something about my husband. My, my husband went to the market and the enemy took him the, the, to the bush and they tied up his hands and they forced a knife at his neck and he started to pray. And those enemies, they asked him, the God that you are praying, will he help you? And he said, yes, he will help me. And those enemies, they told him, and if the, the God can do something, we have been doing so many things, where is he? And they told him to, to, to walk and to start going. As they were going, now the, uh, the, the rope that they tied up his hand starts to be losing. And when they saw that, they came back and they forced the, another knife. And when they forced the knife, he removed it by himself. And when he removed the knife, those enemies were gone and he walked slowly up to the house and we took him to the hospital. And he died. From the time my husband died, it's now 11 years. Through this hard time I had when my husband died, uh, God helped me through the Bible. The constraining love of Christ has sent us back again and again to the Congo. We love the people there, for his sake who died for them, and for their own sakes as well, for they are a lovable people. Um, when we went to the Congo, our, our objective was to strengthen and encourage the believers, but what we experienced went far beyond that. Uh, God had something else in mind. We went to encourage and strengthen, and we were encouraged and humbled by what we saw. Our first response um, was, well, this is Africa. Life is different here. Um, but when we thought it through a little bit more, we had to admit that uh, biblical principles are the same. 
the application might be different. But the biblical principles don't change. In accordance with our Lord's request, this do in remembrance of me, Matopi breaks the bread. Our Lord promised, I will give you the treasures of darkness and hidden riches and secret places. And our hearts responded, The people that walked in darkness have seen a great light. Upon them hath the light shined. So what we have is the power of the cross shining into darkness. There's four life transforming rays of light that shine into the darkness here. The first is the gospel as it's taught from the scriptures. The Holy Spirit empowered word of God working in the lives of these people. I wasn't really aware that the Lord was calling me to translate. I figured that was a high and lofty task in the distant future somewhere. However, having grown up without a knowledge of the Bible, after the Lord saved me, then I had, he gave me the desire to pass on to others the precious truths that I was learning. Already speaking two languages, German and English, I became aware of the fact that the Lord had given me a gift that I would be able to use for Him. And my search for people still without the Word of God led me to Northeast Congo. But I got this in 1960. I'm holding the first edition of the Congo Swahili Bible. Matopi, with quiet radiance and strength showing in his face, is having a Bible study class with other evangelists and Christians. It is encouraging to see each one looking up verses in their worn Bibles, finding the references quickly, if not in the difficult parts of the Old Testament. And when I came out to Congo, most of the New Testament had already been translated. They were the epistles, the prison epistles were still left, and I worked on those. But then there was a translation committee from various missions who translated the Old Testament. You start early, so what time might you start in the morning on your translation work? Well, as you say, 4.35. Well, I tried to do my translation work before any Africans appeared on my front door, which would often be at 6 o'clock in the morning. That's when the Africans arrived, at 6 in the morning? Well, sometimes, you know, you'd have Hody. <laughs> they don't have watches. <laughs> and what were you doing there? What were you teaching the women? What was I teaching them? The Word of God. This gospel. Well, the people were steeped in witchcraft and idols worship as well. They needed the gospel. We know what it is to get into a village. Brother uh, Dr. Harlow and I, going out into the Banyali, we went into some of those villages that seemed like a pall of darkness hung over the whole village. I, I could go on for hours telling of how God has used his word in the souls of the African people in which they've been turned from darkness to light and from the power of Satan to, to God. They've been born again through faith in the Lord Jesus Christ by the miracle of the new birth. What a privilege to carry the light of the gospel to those who are living in darkness and in the shadow of death. 
The second ray of light is medical. To understand and meet the needs of the people, people needed medical help. Medical work gives wondrous opportunities for serving the Lord. Missionaries and Africans have a splendid ministry. Suffering is alleviated and the message of salvation is brought to needy souls. Wayward believers laid low because of illness are lovingly exhorted in the hospital and helped back to useful and victorious lives. Medicine is dispensed to the ill and injured and the stethoscope proves invaluable in diagnosing. Pygmies become infected when they make trips to the villages and drink from the nearby streams in passing. Now their spiritual needs are dealt with as Timoteo preaches earnestly about the crucifixion of the Lord Jesus. Another man joins the group with his monkey skin hat still on. He is reminded by his neighbor to remove it. Some came saying they wanted to believe in Jesus. They bow their heads, confessing him as Lord of their lives. Three brothers have decided to follow God's path together. Having seen the efficacy of mission medicine, many pygmies come for treatment. Pearl Winterburn examines the ugly ulcer and injects penicillin. Na madamazele, nili kutaye kunyankundi, na nili toka kwetu kuboga, kukwenda kunyankundi wakati mili kutaye. Wakati mili kutaye, basi tulibakia na yeo sawa ndugu, Na wakati tulianza masomo tulikuwa ndio na wa, 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 wanafunzi mingi lakini mie milikuwa tu wa kwanza kwa ye. Kusema bati ya chabi huko habana kitu, habana fasi ya kutunza. Basi tulihama kutoka kololo, tulifika hapa kuchabi. Hapa tulikuta hiko tupuri kabisa yo, yote alisalikuwa tupuri. Nguruwe ya poli alipitaka miku mwili hivi. Hivi tulianza alianza kazi alianza kazi ya majengo kwanza alienga nyumba moya pale ku, ya, ya miti na nya, na, na manzanza ndio baliendelea kuyenga kutengeneza briki na kuyenga manyumba ile yote ya hospitali na hata nyumba ya darasa ile ya alijenga hata ile ya sekondari ya alijenga hata kanisa ile alijenga Pearl Winterburn lives all alone but her touch her ministry reaches far beyond this door for surrounding her existing as they have for generations are thousands of people Lives that are precious in the heart of God. Lives that depend on Pearl's skill and love. This servant is one of a special breed of missionary. She can repair her Land Rover just as easily as she delivers a baby. With infinite vigor, she has shared the gospel, built a clinic, a school, even a wind generator to provide electricity. Oh, that's great. It's, uh, it's clear that uh, you've been doing a great deal to help meet the physical needs of these people. Is that the only reason you're here? No. Uh, we really came to present the Lord Jesus Christ to these people mm -hmm. so that they would come to know the true God. Mm -hmm. Pearl is always alert to accent Christ's love with action. That these precious souls hidden for centuries from the gospel may claim with Pearl and with all of us the words of the Apostle Paul. Now unto him who has called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. The third ray of light was education in Bible schools. Early appeals that came in are recorded as having said, send us a teacher. Send us a teacher. Isn't that amazing?
Hear school children march and salute the flag in morning exercises in Northeast Congo. Soon they will be in classes. Education is another great institutional method used by missionaries from early days. They are taught by Christian teachers. Consider these young lives, the incalculable potential of youth. 1,200 children learning to read, hearing the truth of God every day, and many of these children are converted. This is Mary Watson's house. Mm -hmm. Now Mary Watson did uh, the schools. Yeah. The schools. All mm -hmm. the schools. Okay. And uh, especially a special heart for death school. She was the coordinator of all our elementary and secondary schools. Mm -hmm. Yes. That is, this is her house. The boys of the advanced school enjoy marching. Mary Watson, Margaret Petrie, and Ella help in the teaching. This work is forged ahead under Mary's capable leadership. For many years, both Mary and Margaret have rendered fine service for the Lord in the work at Lowa. The fourth ray of light is the literature and publishing. Literature work is strategic, a strategic arm in missionary endeavor in a land of rapidly increasing literacy. Arrival of paper is a joyous event. Yosia Abuzzo, longtime editor of Neno, emerges to inspect the paper. With Yosia Abuzzo, we examine photographic material for use in the next issue. The editorial committee meets monthly to discuss the magazines. Neno reaches Swahili-speaking Congo. The magazines are clean, well printed in the Congo dialect of Swahili. The Lord's message is printed by the millions in African languages. The cover color and illustration of Neno and his Lingala sister change monthly. Many have written telling of having been saved while reading the periodicals. Ilenjo, Madame Harlow, Yosia Bucho, Na mimi, eh, diyo tulitumika ile kazi. Eh, sasa, bibi yaki njua libuwaga mkuba yetu kupremeri, na yenzo litia mikuwa redaktere. Mbo, Madame Harlow, halikuwa redaktere, hiko namjika ile jurnali, ameme ta apre kazi, Anakamata gari, anakamata si wa evangeliste, tunaenda ubiri kumingini za watu. E, nyuma ya ile, anatoka kule kuubiri, tunarudia, alikuwa na biro ngini ya emausi. Ataenda korije sasa, kuru, kuru, korespondas. I have to confess that sometimes I fell asleep in the meetings. And I was sitting with the girls, on their backless benches, and I, apparently I was nodding because in my subconscious mind I overheard the girls saying, one girl saying, the mademoiselle is sleeping. And the other one said, she's tired, let us sleep. <laughs> <laughs> the publishing plan of Editions Evangeliques I mean, this is where the Evangelique was. Yeah, it just sounds like And this is where the heavy equipment was. Yes. Over 50 Christian employees in various departments of the literature ministry. The editors Butso and Yobu come forward. Then the missionary, Mert and Jane Walcott at the left. Merton Walcott supervises the printing plant and is technical advisor of the entire operation. What, you, what was your distribution on the magazine? The distribution of the magazine? Uh, well, up to 30,000. I don't, yeah, I don't recall. What did you have to do to get 30,000 through production? The format, there were usually four pages at a time, printed four pages, and we had probably 16 pages to 
most magazines. So it, it was a project. And then from all of these had to be folded, the, each individual sheet, and then inserted by hand, the sections of the magazine. So we had a good good crew of people that, up in the bindery section especially that did a lot of handwork. And then they all had to be stitched as well, you know, with a foot-operated stitcher, but one at a time. So That was the word of God getting up. Yeah, yeah. Paper edges are trimmed off with the guillotine. Nano magazines ready now for counting and packaging. 30 miles away from Niamkundi is the town of Bunya. With the post office and transportation facilities of the government subsidized trout lines. By these means, from the Niamkundi Literature Center goes the word of God in many languages to evangelical missions and churches and individuals everywhere in the heart of this awakened continent. Distributed to heart-hungry literates, the literature is proving to be God's tool in our day in leading precious African souls to the Lord Jesus Christ. So there's four transforming rays of light shining through this darkness. And Luke records this in Acts. He says, The Lord Jesus Christ came to open their eyes and turn them from darkness to light and from the power of Satan unto God that they may receive forgiveness of sins. This is the light that God shone in the darkness in this country. With the light of the gospel shining in their eyes, their voices blend harmoniously in singing Christian songs. The well-known strains of There's Not a Friend Like the Lowly Jesus drift out into the jungle surrounding the station. chaos in the Congo. Barely 11 days after official independence from Belgium, Congolese troops mutiny and begin a wave of attacks and looting throughout the far-flung sectors of the former colony. This is a, uh, an issue of our magazine, Nenolai Mani, The Word of Faith, a September issue of 1960. And here is the first Prime Minister of the Congo, Patrice Lumumba was his name. This was a very difficult time uh, during Congo's history. But other countries in Africa were, uh, were uh, being granted independence and, uh, and most places it was peaceful, but it was quite uh, chaotic in, in, in the Congo. Premier Patrice Lumumba, who seeks to control the splintered Congo Republic by force of arms, greets delegates. Anti-Lumumba demonstrators mar the occasion. A new chapter begins in the dark and tragic history of the Congo with the return to Leopoldville of deposed Premier Lumumba, following his capture by crack commandos of strongman Colonel Mobutu. Contingents of United Nations troops continue to pour into the Congo, a newly independent, strife-torn, storm center of global tension and controversy. A grave and complex crisis continues, with no easy end in view. Suddenly news blared over the radio. Stanleyville had fallen, and the rebels were heading down our road, which soon would see much bloodshed. Quickly we were uprooted from our work 
and made a speedy evacuation. Farewell, our beloved adopted country. In two weeks, 200 missionaries of northeastern Zaire, including our CMML workers, were forced to evacuate. In the months to follow, 80,000 Africans were killed in northeastern Zaire and a number of missionaries. Even though we had all evacuated, faithful preachers such as Paulus Ugabu continued to fearlessly proclaim the gospel message back in Zaire. Paula bids his family goodbye. In a very short time, many slain in rebel activity would be thrown into the river from this bridge. The last three of us had been flown out just the day before the rebels arrived at Nyankundi with a desire to liquidate several of us, and my name was at the head of the list. We were over to the safety of Uganda, and we had to leave those African Christians. And we heard that our brother Yosia Butso had been killed. He had told the African Christians, when those rebels arrive, I'll speak with them. And if you hear shooting, you'll know that I've been killed, and you run off to the hills and save yourselves. And so when those rebels, when they came, they were indeed very angry. And they said, all right, we're going to capture Bunya tomorrow, but the day after tomorrow, we're coming back and we're going to kill you, you see, Abutso. But before they went, in order to assemble the looting Simbas, they shot into the air. The people heard the shot. And off they went to the hills with news that you see a boots who had been shot. That news came all the way across uh, to Uganda to us. We'd had some sleepless nights. And then uh, the telephone rang from the mission guest house there in Kampala. There's a friend here looking for you by the name of Yosia Butso. What joy. And we thought he was dead. It wasn't true. The report was false. Having evacuated to Uganda from Zaire, Yosia Butso the spiritual leader of our whole work tells Bill Deans the story of his escape. There was a truckload brought in of wounded uh, Simbas, brought into the hospital at Nyankundi for treatment. Two of those officers, Simba officers, who said, we'll be back in two days to kill you, you see, Abutso. They came in screaming with pain, and they died there in the hospital while you see, Abutso was standing beside them, giving them the gospel. But the only news he could bring was of the arrival of the rebels and of one man being killed the day they arrived. He had no news of the Christians, and so we waited, wondering what uh, happened to the Christians. Were they going on the things of the Lord? How are they faring? And uh, for days, for weeks, we had no news, and we wondered if we would ever see their dear faces again. We wondered if the communist-inspired rebellion was, was being used of Satan, as it were, to close the door to the Congo. And then we remembered that the Lord had set before us an open door which no man could shut without the Lord's permitting it. And then one day, about three weeks afterwards, we received a crumpled little note that had been sent out hand to hand, smuggled out of the Congo during the symbol uh, occupation. And this letter said, now don't come back now, folks. Bona, don't come back now. We're uh, having all sorts of uh, danger all about us, but the Christians are gathering together. We've been meeting together to remember the Lord. We're not uh, prohibited in our own local um, assemblies of believers, in our local churches, and the Lord is blessing and keeping our hearts calm. Oh, what joy it was to have that news, that little crumpled letter, I have it yet, what a treasure it was, news that they were standing for Christ over yonder in the Congo. At Lowa, crowds come to the Sunday service in the chapel. With a seating capacity of 600, it can nevertheless hold 1,200 when the benches are removed and the folks sit on the tile floor. And then when we did go back and found that they had gone on in the things of the Lord, and they were numerically uh, greater than ever before, and spiritually they had grown in grace and in the knowledge of the Lord Jesus Christ, and our hearts rejoiced. 
Occasionally, so many are baptized that two baptisms are conducted simultaneously. Village after village is reached. Congolese believers increasingly accept the responsibility for evangelistic outreach. Local assemblies are autonomous and indigenous. Back at Nyamkundi, a farewell conference of commended African preachers, a hundred of them, all serving the Lord in the villages. We go back to our villages with the sword of the Lord in our hands and they wave their Bibles in salute. Ezekiel Guerra in the center gives a happy farewell as we leave for furlough. The witness for the Lord has been brighter since the persecution and dangers of the Congo rebellion. Satan overstepped himself. The gates of hell will never prevail against that church which the Lord is building. He makes the wrath of man to praise him, and the remainder of wrath he'll restrain. He is sovereign. Hello, I'm Rex Trogdon. In 1983, the Lord led me and my wife Nancy to the mission field in Zaire, Africa. We visited some areas that are rarely seen, except by air. When we do get to these villages, we always have a warm reception, even a hot cup of tea to welcome us. At one village, the elders told us that there had not been a white missionary visit in 42 years. What do we find there when we arrive? We find that God is doing a great work among the people. Those early missionaries who pioneered the work in the bush, they planted, and now we have entered into other men's labors, and we're witnessing a great harvest. Within just a 12-mile radius of Eton Day, we've seen over 400 baptisms since 1983. I tell you, God is stirring the hearts of people today. One of, the, uh, one of our first trips that really showed us the change that had taken place in that tribe of the Wanyali was a trip to a place called Mayolo. And when I was there, it was for a baptism. And being the missionary, they always give you uh, a place of honor to speak at a, a quick gathering like that. But there were over 50 people baptized. And right down in the stream, I think they had to kill some snakes and some other animals just as they, they blocked up that stream for the baptism. Yes, the water is quite dirty. The men dammed up this stream for the baptism and had to kill a poisonous snake, a black mamba. But 57 people waded down into these muddy waters without hesitation, eager to publicly demonstrate their new life as believers in the Lord Jesus Christ. But on the main day of the baptism, the, the chief from Kilo, which was a, a very important chief, he was invited also to take part. And he came and his words really showed the difference in Mayolo. He said, I had to come for myself and see. He said, because I would have never sent any of my messengers through Mayolo. They would have been either beaten or robbed or even killed. And he said, but I heard that the gospel has penetrated this area. I had to come and see with my eyes, and I see that peace now prevails. And uh, I thought that was a great testimony, better than a missionary saying the peace and the change that we've seen, but uh, one of their own people and one of the leaders. I delivered this message at a preacher's conference. Believe it or not, I was the 10th speaker. But with babies and family, the Africans were attentive. And it never occurs to them that 14 hours of ministry in a day is too much. I would say we gave them the best thing we could ever give them. I remember a question I was asked by another missionary. Uh, he said, if you leave now, what are you going to have to come back to? Of course, he's talking about buildings vehicles, equipment. And really, I had to come to grips with the fact that if there's nothing to come back to, there was nothing here to begin with. 
The only thing that's really going to last is what you do in the hearts and lives of people. And so in my mind and my heart, the only thing we could have ever given them that was of lasting value was the teaching of the Word of God, the equipping of the saints, the developing of the gifts, and then to entrust them to the Lord. To me, the exciting part of all this is the African brethren are carrying on in this great work of the gospel. It represents work done previously by the missionaries who involve the brethren in the work. Rejoice with me that if and when the missionaries leave, the gospel will continue. I think this is what missions is all about. As one is well said, working ourselves out of a job. I would have to say in 1993 when everything started just to explode and burn, that no one really was prepared for that. One day it happened us. those two two groups who were fighting, they just come to fight near our house. One group decide here and the other one, the other side. And all the bullet on us. It was just a, eh. no, that day it was very, very, very bad. Over there, you can see that's the trace of one bullet in the floor there. It was uh, one day uh, around 3.30 in the afternoon. I was just walking in the street here in the village at Chabi, and then uh, I saw people uh, carrying guns and start sh shooting. Uh, they tried to shoot at me three times and uh, God protected me. Uh, they came straight to my house and my wife was outside uh, staying, I mean, talking to our neighbor. Uh, the, the child was alone at home, uh, sleeping, and when my wife uh, had uh, the shooting, she had to run away and left the baby uh, in, uh, in the bedroom. So when the militia entered in our house, they went straight in the bedroom and they found that the baby was sleeping. So they stabbed him twice uh, in the heart and he was killed. This is the secretary, our secretary of the School of Theology and her mother. Mm. So uh, they were killed in, uh, it must have been 2000, that was 2000. So they wanted to rape her. She said, I, don't, I can't accept that. So they shot here. And she stayed like, no. and they also shot the mother. We saw the mother dead, and we didn't see any sign on uh, the secretary. We thought, May, what is it? And then, then she was just shot there. Yes, and she resisted. And they killed both her and her mother. Nyankunde uh, was destroyed uh, in September 2002. We did visit Nyankunde with the help of the UN. All the walls, because all the houses have been have been destroyed. Then, um, uh, for, for one year, 
nobody will talk about going back to Nyakonde. That was a time to help the uh, displaced people, those who fled, those who had left. And uh, we had now to work a plan to get people back. That day when people tried to go back, a small group of people, then uh, unfortunately the, the militia were around. They killed one, one of them. And uh, so people were kind of afraid. It took us two more weeks to encourage them and to check the place. We had our way of checking the place. We sent three, four young people who make their way to find out whether there are militia around or not. So this, the whole building was the Emmaus Correspondence Courses. This is the office where we manage this. And we have hundreds of, of people taking the courses before the war. And when the war came, so people had to run away and the building was destroyed. And then all the books, the courses were left on the floor. And with the time, the rain was coming, was coming and uh, just, you see the, uh, on the floor, the, the books where they were destroyed. They stayed there for, for two or three years. The first week of cleaning was also the week of burying uh, the remainings of people, bodies, uh, and also identifications. We were able to identify some of them, almost 17, 25 people. Uh, you would identify them by the, the clothes that was left. So family members, friends and relatives, they would come and say, this was so, this was so. But nothing was left except the bones. So it was a, a time when believers have lost everything. I would say in that region, almost 90% of our chapels were destroyed. Christians had nothing. Not only that, I think this war touched, it, it, it really uh, destroyed, it almost, I would say, destroyed our faith. You know, when the conflict is, is, is based on ethnicity, when your enemy comes, they come in one village, they destroy everything, human beings, the burn houses, whatever they find there, they destroy it. And then, at one point, I think most of our, our believers started thinking, where is God? There is no government, and God is not intervening. Nobody will accept to see the enemy coming, other people, the militia, the rebels coming, slaughtering your children, raping your wife in your house, and then kill you. Uh, after eight years of war, people lost almost their faith. It was time for people to start reflecting on what was happening. It was a time to help people to find the way they had lost. And the, the, the Bible and all the literature we got came right at that time. I remember when you are like distributing the Bible, people come, they get the Bible, I see them, at the same time they are distributing the UN food, but they will first go for their Bible before they go to get the UN food. They needed God's word more than physical uh, food they would eat. What I would say, they, was, they were eating God's word, uh, 
the way you eat uh, delicious food. Salut de l'âme. C'est pour ça que je l'aime beaucoup. Et vous allez voir même quand je l'ai reçu, j'avais même acheté hein, les tuiles pour, le pour la protéger très bien afin qu'elle ne s'abîme pas. na kusaidia nayo sana kwa maisha yake. Ndio. Biblia inasaidia mimi sana ndani ya shida. Yeah. Chaque fois kama kwangu ninakuwa na system puisque tulikomea asubuhi tulikuwa na lamuka na 5 tatel funisha siku kufanya maombi kidogo na tunasoma Biblia na meme mangaribi mbele ya kulala na ile sana tunafanya na nasaidia siku kero sana wakati tunapigana puisque shetani iko na uwezo yake. Yeah. Mimi wakati Majari pour nafika, Bible na tous ces They are growing, and the Lord is doing His own work. We are not doing it. Let me tell the truth. The Lord is doing it. We are just following. We are just moving and seeing and watching and making sure that they understand what they are doing, they read the Bible, they understand the Bible, they have the elders, they have the deacons, and they have the right teaching. things that was going through my mind is that when the light of when the light of the Lord shone in that darkness then initially it was missionary work and then missionaries with the African people and then the Africans being supported by the missionaries but now the yeah. Africans mm -hmm. are doing it all right. Yeah. Right. and so the, the light that shone back there that was a glimmer it, it's now shining but it's not shining through missionaries anymore yeah. now so the role has changed mm -hmm. and so did you see any evidence or any examples of uh, change or the role of the Africans has changed because of mentoring that has taken place previously? Well yeah I think that's evident in I mean Kato's a wonderful example of that he was a village boy he worked evenings cleaning buildings to earn money in order to further his education. One, two, one, two, three. <coughs> Good. Uh, I grew up in a, in, a, in a very poor family. I discovered really what my father wanted for me, that he wanted me to study, and that was a big encouragement. He would tell me that every day, that look at me, I'm suffering because I never went to school. I don't want you to be like me. I want you to be different. And the only difference is through education. So this is how I was encouraged to study. When I grew up, I had to go to college and here yeah, I was going for my master's. I remember uh, a lady with whom I went to, the, I, I did a BA in Bunia. He intro, she introduced me to her friend and uh, in the introduction, she was whispering something like, 
that is a very bright guy, but he is a, he's not a Christian. He's a, he smokes like a train, something like, she was saying something like that. And then her friend who didn't know me, she said, but Christ can save him and change his life. And for like one year and a half, coming with her Bible, if I have time, we read together. I had my red Bible, I can't forget that one. So, uh, I decided to give my life to Christ. And now here's Kato, a very humble servant of the Lord, Highly educated. Highly educated. Mm -hmm. Has way more education than I do. And and in he's training other people. And those people are highly educated. And they're giving out the gospel through various means. Not just through literature. Literature is one of them. But through teaching and through through their own experiences. Yeah, it's amazing. But uh, in Emmanuel, in our assemblies, the best thing we do is we open our Bible, we read. And that is the emphasis of training, that is the emphasis of having good teachers, uh, that is the emphasis of like, making sure that our Bible school is running fine, and that uh, the Bible is our priority. So I think the difference is that reading the Bible, love of the Word of God, not preaching from the air or preaching from our own mind. Uh, I think it makes that difference and everybody participating. So we are here at uh, Simbiliabo Assembly and uh, started that small uh, chapel and from that small chapel as it was growing they had to uh, move to this one about 400 and 500, 4, 500. Each assembly uh, have that responsibility of starting small groups, I mean by Bible study groups. They will start like three, four, and we call them prayer cells, and they will grow uh, like from six people to 20, to 40, to 100, to 200, and then they build their uh, chapel and it becomes an assembly. You don't do that, you do it with machines, is it? Mm -hmm. It comes in with a truck. Is it? You deliver it in a truck. The whole, the whole battery turns like this. And they have a responsibility to start around them uh, two, three, four, five other uh, prayer groups that will also grow. So this is the normal movement uh, uh, here in, in, this, in the city and also in all our assemblies around. Even in Bunia, between 92 and 2015, big, big assemblies of 1,200 people, 800. I think the smallest must have 600 people. That is Mbunia. Now, what is it? And uh, uh, we tried and we asked people, what, what draw people to Emmanuel community? They say, because you are serious with Bible study. Because uh, when we go in other churches, the people will preach but they don't open the Bible. But uh, in Emmanuel, in our assemblies, the best thing we do is we open our Bible, we read. And uh, what we do is, who will help us to read? So the, the assembly participates, because each one has his Bible. See the we had 160, 167 
assemblies when we started our ministry. Now we have 259, I think. We have 150 minimum of small groups here and there. Within two, three, four years, they will become assemblies. So we are expecting to have 400 assemblies or 500 within five years. This is the projection as we see it. Yeah, the light is still shining in the Congo and despite all of the difficulties they've had. Uh, there would be times where we would have safaris into Bunya to get supplies. Many times with a, a tropical rainstorm that comes or else if walking back from a village the rainstorm would slow you down and you get back in the dark of night. Talk about dark, I mean it's dark, huh? And uh, we would see the light glowing at Eton Day. And we'd get there, and it would just be a kerosene lamp, or maybe a small light bulb if there was a generator going. And it looked so bright in the distance. So I realized just from that example, even a dim light on a dark night looks bright. And then when you think about how the Word of God goes in and the light of the gospel shining in the face of Christ. People that come to a living relationship with Him. Their lives reflect that light, doesn't it? And uh, you can see it in their countenance. And, you know, we saw people that were so disturbed, I'm sure some demon possessed, and many that were just in bondage. They had saw no way out until the Lord would move in and change a life. And you would see joy take over. And, and so uh, the light, you know, it just <laughs> it gets reflected and deflected in all the different directions, like many faceted glory of God shining there through the saints that reflect His light. I think we could learn a lot of lessons from African believers of how to endure hardness and also in their own worship for the Lord, even amidst the troubles and disappointments of life. And uh, that's the one thing, it, it was real, genuine, and heartfelt, and uh, nothing holding back, living all out for the Lord. I, I, I have a feeling around the throne when we get to glory, we're going to see the Africans are going to be the closest, they're going to teach us how to praise. We went to encourage and strengthen, and we were encouraged and humbled by what we saw.
tired. Let us sleep. <laughs> In the beginning, when there was darkness, as chaos reigned in waters deep, its fury broken, your power spoken. Jesus Christ said, if you love me, feed my sheep. 